why are we all here today? Um, I always get the question of what programming should we be doing for our ERGs? I think we're all familiar with celebrating heritage months or doing mentorship. Um, but another thing that I would really want to encourage everyone to consider is social impact activities, like partnering with community organizations or volunteering. Um, and you might be wondering, so why would we do that? I mean, ERGs are supposed to be internally facing. Um, what is the point? So I think one, number one is to increase engagement. I think in the same way that employees um, want to feel connected to the values or the mission of the company they work for, they also want to feel connected to the values of the ERG that they participate in. Um, so in social impact activities are a great, great way to get people um, to feel connected around like a common cause or a common good. Um, next would be to align with business objectives. I think we all know that companies typically have um, mission statements, value statements that are related to the community. Um, that's why, you know, corporate CSR um, departments exist. So we encourage ERGs to be used as business resources. So aligning with those CSR HR teams um, is an easy way to align with those business objectives as well. Um, also, you, this would help you strengthen your brand. So ERGs, again, should run like a business. They should have their own mission and their own values. And having a pillar that's specifically dedicated to community outreach um, shifts people's perspective about your group being like internally facing to, oh, it's something that is good for an external cause. It's something that's good for the community as well. Um, and then lastly, just to serve your community, I think um, our local communities are bought into our business. They support our business. I think it's just time for us to return that favor. So um, this is something that we like to say a lot. Intent does not always match impact. So my brother and I founded Chesi um, and we are Nigerian immigrants. And Chesi is actually the Igbo word for reflect. And that's because we believe all companies need to do some internal reflection um, to make sure that the intent matches their impact when it comes to their DEI initiatives. I think we're oftentimes pouring a lot of resources, a lot of money, a lot of times into DEI, into ERGs, um, but it doesn't necessarily match the impact that we're having in our organizations or in the community. Um, so the next couple of sections are really gonna be around how to make the most impact um, from your social good activities and ERGs as a whole. Um, we're gonna kind of give you a three-step playbook, give you some best practices on how to do this. And I think that starts with setting trackable goals, um, engaging your stakeholders, and then being consistent with your efforts. Um, and we're gonna go into a little bit more detail right now. So first, setting, um, setting goals. So rowing harder doesn't help if the boat is headed in the wrong direction is the quote that we've chosen here. Um, and I think that just speaks to, we have to determine what success is and have measurable KPIs for that success. Um, this goes beyond just social impact activities. This is a best practice for ERGs as a whole. Um, I think oftentimes when it comes to ERGs and their programming, we have a really hard time of defining ROI and that's because we don't have an idea of what success looks like. Um, you know, if, if success to you is um, getting more engagement, it's going to look different. Your KPIs for that goal is going to look different than like community impact. Um, so when we look at setting goals, I think we have to first start with measurable KPIs. We tend to have super general goals, like increasing the awareness of our ERG within our company, um, which is good. But what does that actually look like? Pete, you need to pick key performance indicators that you can track weekly and monthly and see how you've grown over time. Um, next would be mapping KPIs to your key roles. So oftentimes our ERGs have leadership boards. You might have committees under that, like events, comms, um, development. So having each one of those leadership positions have a key KPI that they're responsible for over time. So for example, um, you might have an events committee. Their goal might be around, um, you know, having events. <laughs> that could just be a general goal. But what are the KPIs to track back against? So that might be number of events planned. It might be an average NPS score of those events. Um, again, these KPIs are just the driving force behind everything that you do. So you want to make sure that you have really tangible and actionable goals to set. Um, and then lastly, having regular check-ins um, about the progress of these goals. So meet with your other leaders in your group uh, discuss the progress that you've made against those uh, measurable KPIs, but then also make adjustments where needed. Um, I think having these trackable goals and really checking in weekly can actually help you see like, oh, we're not making moving the needle forward on this particular goal. Maybe we need to um, adjust our approach. 
Um, just some examples on the right hand side here. So for social impact activities, you might have a couple of goals that you're throwing around. I just picked two here. One of them could be increased engagement, um, which is great, but what does that actually mean? I think measurable, measurable KPIs for that specific goal um, could be around number of volunteers. It could be around number of departments engaged. Again, just some things that you can actually track, put on paper and then give yourself a benchmark and then um, set the goals to hit that benchmark. Um, next might be community impact. What does that actually mean? That might be total volunteer hours or um, amount donated from like a donation drive or something. Again, just having something that you can actually um, you can actually track and measure um, in order to help you determine that success. Excellent. Thank you. I think something else to kind of add on to, especially both of those sections, is that you know, focusing on number of volunteers, departments engaged, total volunteer hours or amount donated, you might not be seeing on this, you know, what your ERG is really aiming for or what in your mind, this is what your actual goal needs to be. These are just really good places to start. From here, as you start to actually measure out some of this information, understanding these goals, you can obviously be able to delve a little bit deeper, get into some of that more nitty gritty type of information that might be a little bit more focused on your specific ERG or the industry that you're in. But this is really just a great starting point to start looking at, you know, who are we actually getting engaged? What's the impact we're having on the community? And from there, you can take from something like total volunteer hours to, well, what's the impact we're having for each one of those volunteer hours? Maybe the hours you have is really good, but you wanted to have a higher level of impact for each one of those. So again, a really good starting point, but also you can go deeper from there. Whatever your organization really helps you support and whatever you're capable of actually tracking and measuring is going to be a great way to go forward with that. Um, before I jump into the next slide, one other thing that was just said in the chat, in case anybody does have questions, we'll have a Q&A towards the end of this program. Um, it will be about 10 minutes long. So if you have questions, please either hold on to those questions or drop them into the Q&A option in the bottom panel of your screen so that we can make sure that we get to as many of them as possible when we're wrapping up the webinar. Now, we want to not just be talking to you about, you know, theoretically, this is what actually works, and this is these are ideas that we've had or conversations that we've had, uh, but also use a little bit more of some real world examples from organizations that we've worked with in the past. So this is an organization where what they were trying to do, um, the ERG was a pride support group at one of the larger technology companies within the world, and their goal specifically was to increase their membership within this ERG from 25% of the overall employees to 40%. And so that means people that are you know, receiving emails from the ERG, attending events, just getting more interested in what the actual programs are that they're putting out, as well as that level of information. Now, pride support as an ERG is one that can be a little bit more tricky, especially to get a fair amount of people to you know, show up and become members of, because while we would like to think that you know, we're becoming more accepting and open as possible, there's going to be a large amount of people that will not feel comfortable being you know, essentially out at work and might feel that if they are part of this resource group, if they are a member of it, then people might interpret that as you, know, you are literally part of this community. And so what their goal was, was to increase the amount of people that were taking part in these programs, but also to make it really clear that they don't just want, you know, because you're part of the LGBTQ plus community that you have to do, that has to be a prereq to be part of the ERG, but also anyone that would consider themselves an ally, curious, interested in looking into and learning more about, you know, what issues are affecting this resource group and this population, that they're also invited into these programs to take part and to learn more. So one of the things that they were able to do is they started during Pride Month of last year. Their goal was to reach 40% employees by the end of this year, so 2022. And they started Pride Month because it's a heritage month. So it's already going to be a time when people are thinking about this individual community, what is going on, what affects them. And from there, they had a pretty consistent amount of events that were going to be focused specifically on this community. So three events that took place last year in June, August, and September. And then this year, they were able to do one in February and then June as well. So their goal was getting from 25% to 40% by the end of this year. They were actually able to achieve that by the end of June of this year. So they hit their mark about six months ahead of time. Now, this is from a variety of different reasons where they were able to actually hit that goal. One is they measured it. So they were tracking, what do we want to do? We want to get from 25% to 40%. They checked before their program started. They were checking after each individual event so they could see, hey, are these events leading us in a positive direction? Are we getting more and more members to take part in the CRG? And they saw early on that they were starting to actually have that increase that they were looking for. 
On top of that, they changed their community, their messaging, as I had said before, with a focus on, hey, we're not just looking for members of this community. We're also looking for people that would consider themselves allies of this community or those who are just looking to take on more information and learn a little bit more. By expanding that, by making it so that people felt more welcome, but also giving you an opportunity to come in and take part in those events, they were able to see not only that they were able to hit their goals, but they were able to do that again six months ahead of time. So this is a really good example of tracking an actual KPI in the beginning, determining what you're going to do to try to change that KPI, and then making sure that you're measuring it the entire way. Thanks, Tim. Um, so shifting gears, we're gonna go over to engagement. I think that's the next best practice when we look at leveraging ERGs for social good. Uh, the quote we have here is, when people go to work, they shouldn't have to leave their hearts at home. We touched on this earlier, but Employees want to work for companies whose values align with their own. Um, same thing with ERGs, um, meaning that people want to feel connected to the people around them. And I think social good activities, community service, volunteering is a really good opportunity um, for people to come together for that common cause. Um, so a couple of best practices here around engagement. So first, a good way to host social impact activities or do some volunteering events is to get other ERGs involved. I think we get this question of like, how can we bolster intersectionality? How can we um, celebrate people's whole identities as opposed to just one identity? And I think a good way of doing that um, is cross ERG collaboration. Um, so when we look at organizations that we can partner with, I took an example of the Audre Lorde project who supports black queer youth. That's a really good opportunity for the black ERG to partner with the pride ERG um, on a piece of programming, on some volunteer hours, on a donation drive. Um, so there are ways that you can just partner, talk to the other ERG leaders within your organization, see what causes their members care about and see if there's a way to leverage each other's support. Um, next would be seeking support and sponsorship from management. I think a goal of a lot of the ERGs that we work with is to have leaders, senior leaders involved and bought in. Um, and I think volunteer opportunities, again, are a really great way of doing so. Um, like I said before, companies oftentimes have goals when it comes to community involvement. That might be a key pillar of their corporate mission statement, corporate values, um, and leaders oftentimes have a duty to honor that. Um, so I think when your ERG is hosting some social impact activities, this is a good way to tap them on their shoulders and see how they can get involved. Even if they don't have the time to actually volunteer with you, maybe there's um, a piece of their budget that can help support um, whatever mission or activity that you're doing. Um, next would be maintaining a healthy distribution across seniority and all functions. So again, volunteer opportunities are a great way to um, get all departments engaged. Um, so there are people across all business functions who wanna support whatever you're doing. Again, people wanna to come together for that good, that social cause. Um, so make sure that when you're announcing this event or opportunity, it's a going around across the organization. Um, this is a pro tip here, but work with internal communications and marketing to amplify your message. Um, there are probably opportunities on your um, company's all hands calls, or maybe you have a company newsletter that goes out. There are opportunities here and there for your ERG to be broadcasted and showcased um, in these company-wide communications. So work with those teams, give them enough notice, but then they can help amplify that message and get the word out there and hopefully get more people involved. Um, and then lastly, collaborate with other functions. We touched on this before, but CSR, this is their main goal. This is their main job. Um, they are doing a lot of this community outreach in their day to day. And I think when an ERG is planning a specific activity, there's a really good opportunity for collaboration and partnership there. Um, whether it be from a budget perspective, whether it be, again, amplifying that message, work with your CSR and HR teams, um, and they can probably pour more resources um, to the cause that you're driving. Um, so again, social impact activities are a great way to get everyone in the company involved, um, but also um, not just in this particular activity, but in your ERG as a whole. Excellent. So we have another example of um, that some of you, if you might have tuned into the last Gadara webinar, you might be familiar with uh, Jo. She's a director who works within Citrix um, and was part of essentially our last webinar where we talked about coordinating an entire month of service to take on programs. Now, what Joe is also part of is the Women's Inspirational Network at Citrix. Um, this is an ERG that is focused on obviously getting women within the workplace to be able to network and to have a lot of other opportunities. 
And what they were looking to achieve as an organization, so kind of getting back to what their actual KPIs would have been, is increasing levels of C-suite sponsorship. So people that are in higher up positions, working directly with those that are you know, either middle management or entry-level positions, but having that level of sponsorship and really understanding that you know, internal networking and just being able to have communication and that access within the organization but also from a wider perspective to increase the amount of you know, diversity within the workplace at Citrix, bring more women in. It's an organization that obviously is within STEM in general. And so what they wanted to do is make sure that they as an ERG were able to be really focused on this and get that level of support. But they also realized that a lot of what their goals were within the ERG aligned with what, as Deme was just saying, what a central CSR team is going to be looking at. The CSR team is also focused on increasing certain levels of diversity, reaching certain goals. And so there's a lot of times where even though this ERG might be just trying to focus on something that's a little bit more, again, employee focused, the actual central team is going to have a lot of the resources and the reach to be able to help them and their goals overlap. So what they were able to do is they were able to reach out to essentially the CSR team within Citrix explain to them what they were looking to do, have conversations about what the CSR team was looking to do, and find areas where they can actually collaborate and work together to make sure that they're having a much stronger result from those actions and that, that engagement. This brings kind of two different levels of expertise and speciality into the exact same conversation and therefore pulling in the same direction. Obviously, a team like a central CSR team is going to have more access to resources, be that the amount of people that they actually have within that area, be that the financial amount that that team has been given in order to achieve those goals. But as we all know, the resource group often is going to have a much better level of actual knowledge, really intimate knowledge with what is the actual problem? What is it that the women within this workplace are telling us? What is it that women within STEM who want to work at an organization like ours are telling us? And therefore, making sure that you can align those two different sections of the same organization to do the exact same thing. This is a really great way to support the ERG's work with, again, you know, some central backup, again, for resources, for communication, for being able to reach out, but also make it so that the CSR team is making kind of less learning mistakes as they're able to reach out directly to that ERG, to those group of women, and get more information about what it is that they're trying to achieve and avoid some of those immediate pitfalls that they might take on in the immediate uh, aftermath of starting this program. Yeah, I think that's a really great point. Um, HR teams and CSR teams have goals around meeting charitable giving or um, making the workplace more inclusive as a whole, being really people first. Um, and I think how they do that is by leaning on the people who are living it, who have that lived experience of being a woman in this workplace, being a woman in this society. Um, and your ERG is a really great kind of focus group for those teams to lean on. So um, there's a lot of collaboration opportunities there. And we really encourage ERGs to leverage those different business units and see how they can get involved. And one other thing, although I'm supposed to switch slides and, and hand it back to Dume, but I wanna play off something that she mentioned earlier, especially talking to your own internal marketing team or the marketing team in general, if you're doing something, have them help you celebrate it, right? They're going to be looking for, you know, basic photos, information about what the event is, but being able to send out an internal email celebrating something that the organization is doing or members of the organization are taking part in is something that's going to be, you know, a really easy barrier to get across. And so involving them a little bit in, hey, this is what we're looking to do. Can you reach out to other members to take part in it? Can you help us design out an email? Whatever it might be, there's going to be a lot of members within your organization that will want to lend a hand and, you know, reaching out to those who are all already an expert in their field is a great way to do that. For sure. Um, and then the last slide we have here, or the last best practice that we're going to give you here is consistency. Um, we don't have a quote for this slide, but the key takeaway is that this shouldn't be a one-time thing. Um, I think what we oftentimes see from ERGs is that they're really, really focused on their specific heritage month. So the Black ERG might be really focused on Black History Month. Um, the Pride ERG is really focused on June and creating uh, Pride programming. Um, but don't let it stop there. Your ERG should be doing consistent, consistent events throughout the year. Um, I think that's how you really sustain the success that you've seen in the past. So if you wanna sustain that increased engagement, if you wanna sustain the community impact, um, this can't be a one-time thing. It has to be something that is continuously on the calendar um, and your members are you know, knowledgeable about all the events that are coming up. Um, so a way to sustain that success, a way to be consistent is to one, create a program calendar for your ERG, not just for volunteer events, um, but all ERG events. 
Um, you should be planning events three months out. You should be having, you know, um, calendar invites in people's inboxes. You should be having a shared calendar so everyone can see all of the ERG events. Um, again, if people know that there are multiple things coming up, there are events that they can be involved in, um, it increases their, um, or it changes their perspective to like start to look out for these events and the things that your ERG is doing, hence keeping up with engagement and getting more and more people involved. Um, next is to seek out Heritage Month and holiday opportunities. I know I just said, don't just do Heritage Months, but it is also a really great time to partner with community organizations. Oftentimes during you know, holidays or given, give, giving season, um, community organizations are really in demand um, for volunteers. They're really seeking people to help out, corporations to you know, sponsor them, whatever it may be. Um, so during these times, reach out to your local organization, see how you can help, see how you can get on a continuous calendar um, to support their efforts. Um, and then lastly, kind of just moving into that same point is partner with community um, organizations. Have a formal partnership where you are volunteering monthly, bi-monthly, quarterly, whatever it may be. Um, again, having just consistent programming that your members can lean on and like look forward to um, when it comes to your ERG and their social impact activities. Um, so yeah, just a kind of a key takeaway or bundling it all together. Consistency really does drive engagement. Again, if your members know that they have something to look forward to, if they know that you know, every week, every month we volunteer at this organization, they can just put it on their calendar. It's not something that you have to like beg them to attend. It's something that they actually look forward to. And I think that goes beyond social impact activities. I think it with any piece of programming that you do, don't make it a one-time thing. I think we often see, you know, we're going to do a happy hour here. And then that's the end of it. That's the end of your ERG programming for the next three months. Don't do that. Let's have it monthly. Let's have it bi-weekly. Let's have it something that your members are actually actively um, looking forward to. So a really good example that we have of an organization that we've worked with is actually with Red Hat. Um, and so as an organization, they take this kind of almost to the next level and where they are making sure that they've planned at least one event for every single month for the entire next year. So as of right now, they're actually in coordination for planning out all of 2023. And the way that they do that is exactly what Dumebi's talking about. It's a combination of one, hey, if this is an opportune month for you know one ERG or one group to really shine because it's heritage month or there's a heritage holiday that's gonna be really focused on this specific month, then it's a great time for them to be able to take the spotlight and for other resource groups to really support them in that, right? We're not necessarily all trying to stand on stage at the exact same time and get as much spotlight as possible. But when you have an organization that, you know, it's a heritage time, you can allow them to really be at the forefront of communication, but also getting other resource groups to, you know, collaborate and work with them. And there's a lot of room for overlap, right? There's a lot of different ERGs that, although they might be focused on one specific community, a lot of the work that they do is going to be overlap. There are, you know, people within the LGBTQ plus community that are also people of color, and therefore you have programs that might work together in ways that you can ally and do the exact same things. Again, really bolstering yourself and helping you support yourself. Now, in what they have done or what Red Hat has done specifically is by taking the step to plan out you know, a year's worth of activities, it allows them to plan everything else around it at the exact same time. So what this means is that not only are you just talking about the individual events that are gonna be taking place, but you can build out your entire communication strategy as well. You know when the event is gonna happen, you can start preparing people with those emails, with letting you know, with follow-up information, et cetera. All of that is done well ahead of time. We all know that if you try to change you know, any personal habit, some type of workout routine, et cetera, consistency is going to be one of the most important things that you're really taking on. And so making sure that you have a consistent plan and you continue to follow through with it, that will lead to a level of discipline and where people just know, hey, this is what's going to take place. The same way that your favorite TV show might be you know, every Sunday at nine o'clock, you will start to automatically just know, hey, it's Sunday, my show is going to be on. Same with if you have your event being the first Monday of every single month. As you start to create that you know, level of consistency, people can depend on, hey, there's gonna be an event, even if I don't know what the event is, I know that there's something available to me, I can jump out, I can participate in it. 
The other is that it takes a lot of work to get all this communication out. If you have an initiative that you're talking about and that you want to celebrate, it takes a ton of work from your side internally, getting all those stakeholders pulling in the same direction, making sure you're sending out that communication, and then also following up after it, similar to here, you know, thanking people for who participated, sharing a little bit of that impact information with them. If you're just doing all of that on an, one event, you know, in the first quarter and then another one in the last quarter, but no communication in between, you're starting from zero every single time. So even if, you know, every single event doesn't get a ton of people to actually show up, you don't reach kind of, you know, breaking records every single time, the level of consistency will make it so that as you're trying to ramp up for an event that might be more important to you, let's say it's a speaker or an impact event where you're going into the community, it's easier to rely on those lines of communication. People will be more familiar with what it is that you're doing, and therefore you'll have a much easier time, again, getting more support, getting more people involved. So it's important to really have an idea of you know, what things you're going to do, whether they are you know, individual events, whether they're speakers, whether they're happy hours, whatever it actually is, Having that level of consistency for events allows you to be much more consistent within your communication, and also, therefore, you can have more people involved. It also, again, as we mentioned a little bit early on, it, it allows for you to not kind of step on the toes of other resource groups, because if you've planned what you're doing, you're never going to have an event taking place at the exact same time as another resource group, therefore splitting people who might be more interested in one as opposed to the other. It allows you to do a little bit more of that collaboration and really just make sure that in general, everything's working out and going in the same direction. So having a level of consistency once you've decided on your events, once you've decided on the programs that you want to do is going to be really useful in making sure that, you know, that hard, heavy lift that you're going to be doing in the beginning is going to be a little bit easier as we go through um, and as you are actually being able to, you know, complete those individual events. That was a really good point you just made around um, if you do something at the beginning of the year and then do something at the end of the year, you're starting from zero at that next that next event. Like that's a really good way of thinking about it and really powerful. Um, you want to be doing something monthly, weekly, whatever your cadence is, just so people can anticipate that and look forward to it. Absolutely. And so this brings us essentially to our Q&A, but before we get there and start taking some of the questions, there are a lot of questions and they are really interesting looking questions. Um, so I'm excited to answer some of those, but I want to just kind of put a cherry on the, on the top of this as an entire webinar. And that first, one of the most important things that you're going to have to do as an organization, as a resource group, or as an individual, if you're looking to start a resource group is what are the goals that you want to be measuring? What is it that you're trying to actually achieve? Where is that level of impact? Don't be afraid to you know, start small or start with kind of simpler levels for KPIs or for metrics. You can always build as you start to get you know, more information, more people as part of your team, more of that information that's going to be used to just you know, verify, hey, this is why what we're doing is important. This is why it matters and why we need some more support from within the organization determining those levels of actual KPIs, those metrics you're going after, and then how you're going to actually be measuring them are going to be really important, both in you measuring your actual success, but then also in reporting back your actual level of success when you're looking for more, you know, again, more assistance, more resources, or whatever it might be. When you have a good idea of what those metrics are, what those KPIs are, that will also allow you to have a better perspective on who do I need to involve to be able to reach these goals. Is this something that I can do by myself? Is this something I can do within you know, the group that we have already existing within this resource group? Or do I need to involve you know, a central CSR team? Do I need to reach out to have uh, you know, a member of the community or an organization in the community work directly with me? Do I need to start collaborating, or collaborating with an already more established resource group to learn a little bit more about them and to have their influence really affect us in a positive way? By doing that, by understanding who you need to engage, how you need to engage them, that will also make sure that, again, you're able to reach these actual KPIs, these metrics that you're looking for. And then with an idea of what you're aiming for, an idea of who you're going to be bringing along with you or who you're going to help get you to where you want to go, the next is going to be having a level of a consistent plan. So, you know, starting small, as Jamaica was saying, maybe your events are once a quarter or once a month, ideally, you know, getting down to the point where you can do them every week or every other week. But don't try to, you know, shoot for the moon, boil the ocean in the first try and just get what it is that you need to be doing, build off of that level of consistency and making sure that that level of consistency and discipline really is something powerful for you going forward so that you can have those events. People know when they're going to take place, but they also know how can they reach out to you? When are they going to learn about the next event? What is that communication style actually going to be like? 
all of that information is going to be really valuable for you. Um, and so making sure that you have that level of frequency and that level of consistency within communication is going to be super valuable. Before we jump into Q and A's, do maybe you have anything else that you want to say before we? I think on? you put a nice bow on top. Um, that was a really nice summary. I do think um, consistency, if nothing else, should be everyone's key takeaway. Um, that's something that we get asked a lot. Is like, how can we increase engagement? How can we get more people involved? And I think it has to do with not just doing something on your heritage month, not just doing something at the beginning of the year and then letting it fade out. Um, you have to have consistent programming, whether it be social impact activities or whether it just be a book club or a member meeting, um, just having something that people can look forward to and uh, can get involved with. Excellent. And without any further ado, so I have a large amount of questions that have been uh, sent directly to me. So in no specific order, I'm going to just quickly go through them. Um, so the first one, and I will, I'll send this to you, Dimebi, what is a good way to ensure that your ERG's big scale events don't clash with other ERG's big scale events? Yeah, so I think this is where that shared ERG calendar comes in. Some people use like their SharePoint pages. Some people use Google calendars. Um, obviously on the Chesley platform, that's a part of our capability in terms of like making sure all of your ERG events are in one place. Um, but I do think that it is super important to make sure that you know when other ERG events or pieces of programming are going on, just so you're not one competing with employees or with the other groups in order to get employees to attend, but two, there might be opportunity for your ERG to support that piece of programming. Um, so I think just having some type of shared calendar would probably be the best way. Or if you can't, you don't have that capability, maybe having like an ERG lead um, Slack channel or Teams channel where you all can communicate about upcoming events or programming that you're doing. Um, but again, Chesley could also help you do that. I agree with absolutely everything that Demebi said. I would uh, kind of also just bringing back to, you know, the consistency that we were talking about, the longer you're planning out, the easier it is to make sure that you're not stepping on each other's toes and having events at the exact same time. The other reality is that, you know, not every event is going to be focused on Heritage Month, um, you know, for positive, unfortunately, more often for negative reasons. There are serious events that take place within our societies and that ERGs are going to react to and try to have an events, right? Uh, the killing of George Floyd was one where you see a lot of people immediately want to take on events that were more focused on diversity. And so when you have something that's popping up more, you know, in your face, it's not something that you were able to plan for, um, then having some of those conversations is a really good way to do that, just reaching out to other ERGs and being involved in that. The other thing that I would personally suggest, and this may be, you know, depends a little bit more on how many people are members of your resource groups and what resource groups exist, but have members of your resource group, especially if you consider them kind of part of leadership or someone who's helping within it really drive everything forward, have them attend other ERG meetings, have them learn from those other resource groups, right? Even if they don't consider themselves part of that necessary community, you might not consider yourself a veteran because you never served in the military, but it doesn't mean that there might not be something that you can learn from running a resource group from the veterans resource group. This will also obviously allow you to make sure that you're not going to be you know, stepping on each other's toes or for communication because you'll know when events are taking place. So allowing that a little bit more of just like fraternization, working together and understanding that I think will also help aside from just having a solid schedule is going to make it so that you can see what people are doing in the future and avoid kind of doing it at the same time. All right, let me see another question. So another question is, um, we've talked about uh, automation while discussing setting goals. Can we talk a little bit about what tools you would recommend for this? So maybe would you like to go first? For automation? Yep, yeah, just we talked about automation while discussing setting goals in general. Sure. Um, so can we talk a little bit about what tools we would recommend for, for that? I, I don't want this to be a Chessy plug of, of <laughs> conversation. But I will say that something that we see as a pain point for ERG leaders and DEI managers is that they have no benchmark for what success looks like for their ERG. They might have something general around like building inclusive workplaces, um, strengthening the sense of belonging for our employees. But like, what does that look like on a tangible level? Um, and I think that goes back to setting those measurable KPIs. So is that number of departments involved? Is that what levels of um, like of the levels of the business, what levels are most involved in our ERGs? Like, what does that look like for you? And I think once you've set those KPIs, you can either do that 
um, in a Google Excel where it's something that you can easily access and like make a dashboard on like, this is my KPI, this is what goal, well, this is what it looked like on week one, this is what it looked like on week two, and then continue to just kind of track progress from there. Or with Chesi, we do give you kind of like a dashboard of your membership so you can see like who's participating, what, how your ERG membership grew within the last 30 days, um, NPS score of events. So we're giving you a dashboard with all the data you need in order to benchmark that success for your ERGs and then hopefully self set new goals um, based on those metrics that you're capturing. Um, so I think there's like a more manual way of doing so in terms of like having some type of project management solution or an Excel or something and kind of tracking those KPIs or, you know, Chesi was built for ERG specifically. So we have those, that data kind of relatively available in terms of like who's participating, what um, the feedback is around your ERG, um, what does membership look like, that type of thing. Absolutely. And I, and I think it's a fabulous question. The answer is kind of depends on your KPI, right? So there are, uh, trust us, we represent them. There are organizations that will be able to help you automate and track some of the information that you're looking for. But what you're looking for is really going to come from you internally. So again, you know, representing Gadera, if what you're looking to do is take part in events and you want to know how many people registered, how many people actually showed up, what was their opinion of the event, what was the impact, we're going to be a great organization to do that for you. But what process, what platform, who you're talking to, can you do it in Excel? Do you need somebody else you know, externally to help you with that? It's all going to be a reflection of what it is that you're actually aiming to try to track, what you want to actually achieve. And then from there, you can start having the conversation of, okay, well, what platform or what service or what person do I need to be able to actually help us achieve that? So great question, but it's one of those where the answer will actually start with you. Um, <laughs> So another one, and this one directly for you, Demebi, is can you address the topic of monetary compensation for ERG leaders? How is this determined? What is equitable for the work ERGs provide for the community around impact and engagement? Yes, um, I get this question a lot. Um, and I think just to give some context, I think ERGs and DEI there tends to be a lack of like best practices, honestly. Like there is no like standard for what you should be giving your ERG leaders. But I will say when considering mon uh, monetary compensation for your leads, um, it shouldn't necessarily be built into their salary. It's almost something that is like a, a quarterly bonus or an end of year stipend or something like that, where it's like a one-time payment. Um, so consider that in terms of format, as far as amount goes, whatever you think is equitable. Um, and I'm just going to leave it at that. Um, but also, if your company isn't at a place where it can monetarily compensate your ERGs, you do have to consider how you're going to incentivize them. How are you going to recognize them? How are you going to reward them for all the work that they're putting into their ERG, um, into building inclusive workplaces for your company? Um, so if you can't do like a monetary you know, stipend, bonus, whatever it may be, think of other ways that you can incentivize them, whether it be like exclusive professional development opportunities, whether it be one-on-one -on -one mentorship with C-suite leaders, whether it be um, recognition on a company all hands call where your CEO is like promoting and recognizing and honoring them and all the work that they're doing. Um, I think regardless of which route you go, there does have to be something in place to recognize your leaders and then also prevent the burnout because working in DEI is hard, working with ERGs is hard, um, and in order to continue to fuel their passion in order to continue to get them to continue to do this work, um, there has to be kind of a recognition or reward system in place. Excellent. Um, so the next question is, how do you communicate to people, leaders, managers in an organization to get their team or employees to participate in these ERGs, volunteer events, and increase engagement? Most times employees say that they can't find the time or they don't have the time because of their workload. Yeah. So I think when it comes to leaders, leaders are more data driven typically. Um, mm -hmm. So I think that kind of goes back with setting those goals. Like what is the impact of your ERG? What is the impact of this like event or piece of programming? And like, how can I contribute to that impact? Um, so I think you kind of have to spell it out from them in like a, business case or an ROI case in terms of like, our ERG is increasing retention by X amount. This is how you can continue to support that and support your marginalized employees and whatever it may be. So um, I do think it kind of, you have to work backwards, create like your objectives, create your goals, and then kind of spell that out to the leadership in order to get them involved. And then I think from a employee perspective, 
you have to find out what your employees want to see out of your ERG. Um, if your employees want like mentorship opportunities, if they want access to leadership, start there from a programming perspective as opposed to happy hours or book clubs or some of these things that like might not have a lot of value or relevance to them. Um, so I think it might just start with like taking a pulse of your employees, your current members, seeing what they want from a programming and events perspective and then producing that type of event. I absolutely agree. I think some other things I would add on to that is one from the leader and manager's perspective is uh, they need to really be supporting the actual resource groups in doing that. And so if you're still giving people a full workload or 110% of their normal workload and then expecting them to participate in these events in their free time, that's probably not a really realistic expectation. That's we're already doing a fair amount of work throughout the entire week. People have lives outside of that. So one of those is, you know, blocking out time within your, you know, your associates, other employees calendars during the actual work day, showing, hey, not only are we going to create these for you, but we're going to do it, you know, Wednesday right after lunch so that people can participate you know where they're going to be, they're going to be available and can make sure that that actually happens. Um, I think that that is one of the things that's really important as far as, you know, from the actual leadership, make sure that the time truly is available for your employees to do that and that it doesn't become, you know, another stressor, another thing that they feel like they're obligated to do, but don't have the time to do it. On top of that, and this is kind of going back to the first example that I talked about earlier in this webinar, is make it clear that, you know, you don't necessarily have to be part of a community to be able to join the resource group and to take part in their volunteer events. You can be an ally. You can be just interested. You can just be someone who's really passionate about, about doing volunteer events, regardless of what resource group is putting it on. So making sure that, you know, as you're inviting people in, as you're trying to get those who are actually involved, that it's not a, look, if you're part of this community, then, then you should be going to these events, but more of a, hey, we're putting this on so that more people can come in, can learn a little bit more about this community, can feel welcome, and can have a greater level of understanding. So, a slight combination of, um, from my perspective, is changing the way you message out to people and getting them to invite them, getting them involved. But on top of it is also you know, making sure that organizations and that leaders are not just saying, well, they don't have time because they can't find time. Sorry. Making sure that the organization is finding time for people um, and then they're not forcing them to do it you know, after work, on their weekends, in their already limited free time. All right. All right. So we have time for one or two other questions. And so here's another another question. Um, we work at a global organization. Can you speak about how folks have addressed virtual events and or ensuring engagement across varying time zones? Do you want yeah. to jump in this first? Yeah, I can take and feel free to jump in as well, Tim. But I think there just has to be a wide variety of events. Um, I think everyone is kind of experiencing webinar burnout, Zoom burnout, Zoom fatigue, whatever you call it. Um, so I think one, having a wide variety, whether it be like a panel event, whether it be like having a well-known speaker come in, whether it be um, having like some type of gamification of like a learning topic, whatever it be, whatever it is, just make sure you have a wide variety of them and that each each variety or each kind has some type of engaging factor. You're asking the audience questions, you're doing polls. Um, yeah, I think you just have to make it as engaging as possible. And I think as the world starts to open up, as offices start to open up, there is still the opportunity for like hybrid events as well to where like you have an in-person segment, but you also have a virtual event. So people can kind of pick and choose where they wanna step in and get engaged. Absolutely. So some other things that I would, I would love to add to that is that, especially in this example, as you know, the, the organization is a global company, is that there's a lot more flexibility with a virtual event than there is for an in-person event. Um, with an in-person event, it's going to have a time, it's going to have a place. Because it has a place, then that time is going to be based on that time zone. It's not going to be accessible to everybody who might be out of state, out of country, you know, different continent makes it a little bit more difficult. So especially as a global team, one, the flexibility of virtual is that you can offer the same event multiple times throughout the day so that members from your Pacific team, from your East Coast team, but also from EMEA, from APAC, all of those members can take part in the exact same event, even if they're not able to do it at the exact same time with all of those members. So what that means is that by the end of a 24 hour time period, you might've had everyone within your organization who was invited to take place in or take part in the exact same style of event with the same focus, working at, base, at times even with the exact same nonprofit um, to get that level of information and that level of unity. 
Another thing that I would say is really important, especially with your global team, is understanding that your team is global. So sometimes they might want to take part in the entire you know, program that you're doing and focusing on what that is. But you know, if English isn't their first language, making sure that you're doing that program in a culturally sensitive way for them. If they are going to be speaking Spanish first or French or Kiswahili or whatever it might actually be, run the program in the language that they're going to be able to speak so that people can feel comfortable doing it and not feeling like you know it's going through another, another test or something where they're going to feel like a fish out of water. So a combination of just really leaning into virtual events, there's a lot of flexibility in doing it. If you can make sure you have a quality event, repeat it multiple times so that everybody can get involved. You don't have to stay up till weird hours to be able to do it. And then make sure that if you're doing it, do it really in a great way so that people feel comfortable again, you know, speaking their language, being in an area that's going to be more of a safe space, and they can really enjoy the actual event. I'd also add to that, you mentioned, make sure you're having it in like a global mindset, but also make sure you're having it in an accessible mindset. Um, so there are some people who are hard of hearing, they might need closed captioning, they might need an ASL interpreter, um, try and gather that information before your event and then make sure you have the right tools and um, accommodations in place for those folks. All right, I think we have time for one last question and this is one that will, I think speaks to both of us a lot is how do we help ERG leaders and members stay engaged during their busy season so whatever that busy season throughout the year might actually be. Sorry, I was reading a DM I just got. Can you <laughs> can you read yeah. that one again? No worries. How do we help ERG leaders and members stay engaged throughout their busy season? Yeah. Um, one, I think it comes with that incentive we talked about. Um, if there is no incentive for them to continue the work while they have other things to do, other things that might be top of mind, they're not going to do it. Um, and then two, I think as they see the impact that they're having, as they see that they can cross some things off their list in terms of the KPIs that they've set, the goals that they've set, the impact that they're having within the organization and beyond, um, it just helps to boost that morale um, and wants and makes it more enjoyable for them to continue the work, even if they have something else on their plate. Excellent. I think um, for me, what I would say is one, Again, going back to kind of that consistency, if you have a plan for the entire year, it makes it a little bit easier to kind of prevent that level of burnout or being overburdened during a busy season. The other is just divide out tasks. Don't try to take anything on by yourself or a small team of two or three people is divide out the different roles, you know, communication, event planning, having meetings with other ERGs, et cetera, whatever it might be have people that are in charge of each of these individual roles so that you don't have everything kind of siloed in the same person. Yeah. But anyone who's doing that role should have someone else that is helping them do that role so that when they have a major project, when they have something that takes place in their personal life, right, you have someone who understands how to do the exact same thing, is already familiar with it, and so you can have someone else step in and take that on. On one side, it's a great way to just create better leaders within your resource groups, see who's going to be someone who might be, you know, leading the organization or leading that resource group going forward. But at the same time, knowing that you can rely on somebody else is the whole point of kind of building out these communities. So lean into that, right? Making sure that you have people that have different roles, but they also have someone to help them when they're in a time of you know, extra work or something personal or just when they need some type of assistance. Tim, you just hit on a best practice. Always have two co-leads. I know a lot of people have one and it's like, whoa, we have a lot going on. But if you have two, you can kind of share those responsibilities. Um, and then depending on the size of the group, you can have committees that kind of fall under those leads. Excellent. Absolutely. I mean, if you try to do it all by yourself, and almost another, another sorry, I have one, don't want to add on to that. Um, if you're relying on just yourself or on a small team, you are setting yourself up for eventual failure. Now, if you would like to work with that organization you're currently employed by for the rest of your life, that is great. Um, if you can take on that role for the rest of your life and you'll never have a personal or professional thing that will get in the way of your ability to do that, that is also great, but it's not very likely. Having other people means that if you're really passionate about the resource group that you're part of, if you're passionate about just that group of people in general, having someone else understand what their roles are and having you know one or two, three different people that can jump in and just be, you know, that utility person to help out makes it so that your resource group will be more successful. And so that if you step away because you have a project, again, something personal, or you leave the organization for something else, 
you have left the organization in a better place because there's someone else to step in. They understand their role and they also understand how to kind of work with the next level of, of someone to bring them up into that position and then continue on within internal leadership. And I think we have time for maybe one last question. Um, the last question is what KPI strategy can best be applied on ERGs to drive funds, especially when the organization is invariably young? Yeah. Um, so are the ERGs young or are the, is the company young? It's um, my read from the organization from the question would be that the company itself is relatively young. Okay. So I think a lot of the KPIs can be centered around membership and engagement. So when it comes to membership, how many members do you have from what departments are they coming from? And then what levels are they coming from? Um, I think it's really nice to have entry-level folks involved in the ERGs, but also when senior leaders get involved, that also helps to drive that participation there. Um, from an engagement standpoint, I would look at the programming that you're hosting and see how many people attended um, with Zoom and some of these other webinar tools, you could actually see how long people stayed on. So are they finding the programming and the events that you're putting on helpful? Are they looking at them as resources? Um, and then I'd also look in like your Slack channels and see like, what does that engagement look like? Um, so are people reacting to posts? Are people engaged in like discussion questions? Are people asking questions? Um, so just kind of looking at those two things. And then I think as those mature and as your ERG matures, you could also start to look at some more um, retentive, retention based KPIs and also promotion based KPIs in terms of like, if someone is involved in your ERG, are they more, more likely to stay at your company? Um, and then if they are involved in an ERG, are they more likely to get promoted or get into a senior leadership position? Um, so those are a couple to consider. I think when you're younger, you might just want to start with like engagement and membership based KPIs. Absolutely agree. I think another thing that I would add to that is if the organization is really young, you're going to have a very difficult time proving the resource group's return on investment within that organization just because you don't have much of a timeline, again, within the organization. But feel free to reach out and look at you know, the rest of the industry and what turnover rates are, what those diversity rates are. And that's a good way that you could be able to show, hey, we haven't necessarily you know, committed this issue yet. But organizations that are in a similar space that us work in a similar industry, these are some of the returns on investment that they could have gotten from a resource group like ours. And that is why we feel that, you know, a level of investment or more access to resources is actually going to, you know, have a better return on the bottom dollar for the organization as a whole. So a lot of different ways to do that. If the data doesn't exist within your organization, look for other ways to get it. Um, but I also think that it's about time to kind of wrap up this webinar. So... I want to thank again everyone for taking part in the, the the webinar for asking such great questions. This is the best part about working with ERGs is that everybody is really intimately you know aware of what is going on, why this is really important. Uh, I also want to thank you, Demevi, for all of your amazing information for sharing that with me over the past couple of weeks that we've worked together, but as well as you know everybody who is here. Um, and I'll pass it over to you so you can say your farewells. I am on mute. So well, thank you first, Tim, uh, for being a great co-host. I've loved kind of presenting with you. Uh, but then thank you to our audience for joining. I really loved all the thoughtful questions that were dropped in the chat. Um, I know we didn't get to answer all of them, but if you want to continue the conversation, if you have some questions around your ERGs or you're starting an ERG, um, I'm more than happy to meet with you. I think my email was dropped into the chat, but it's demebi, D-U-M-E-B-I at chesi.co. Um, to maybe at chessy.co would love to talk to you um, and see how we can take your ERGs from intent to impact. Perfect. And as we have just dropped in the chat as well, we'll be sending out the recording of this so you can share it with your team later on. Thank you everybody for being here. Have a wonderful rest of your day and rest of your week. Bye y'all. Take care.